Uh, so I've been doing um, podcasts and uh, interviews all day, so my voice is crackling. Uh, there's a funny thing when you promote a book that uh, everyone asks you sort of the same questions. Uh, and the first question is always, what's your book about? Um, and I've been repeating the answer over and over again. And at some point, I decided that um, that was really no fun and that I wanted to be entertaining with it and try to come up with a new description every time. So if you hear me on a podcast like sounding like I don't know what I'm talking about, that's why, because every time I'm trying to say something new. Um, it's kind of like being in a creative writing class in college where you, the professor walks out and he like lays a bunch of carrots on a table and he says, write a short story about the carrots. And then you, you sit there and you write a short story. And then two days later, he comes back and sets the same bunch of carrots on the table. And he says, write a short story about the carrots. And you do it over and over and over again. That's what promoting a book is. You're just like describing the same thing over and over and again. So um, I can feel my voice already crackling. Um, so all of that said, uh, it is really an encyclopedia. That is the odd thing about it. It is organized from A to Z. Um, it has entries uh, like you might find in a normal encyclopedia. It's very broad. Uh, topics range from cognitive psychology to reality television, professional wrestling, artificial intelligence. Uh, it really goes all over the place. Um, and as you start to read them, I think that you will, you'll get a sense that um, I start to play with the idea of it being an encyclopedia. Some of them read like straightforward entries, like you might find in an actual encyclopedia. But then it kind of goes crazy. There are short stories in there. There are charts, beautiful charts. Thanks to Abrams, by the way, for producing it. It looks beautiful. Um, there's footnotes. Um, there's an obituary in it. Like it really tries to like spaz out on the idea of being an encyclopedia. Um, so I thought I'd just uh, I'd read a little bit from the intro to give you a sense of what you're getting into. And oh, I have visual aids here, too. All right. Just from the very first words of the book. Several months before this book was published, a curious advertisement started to appear on the streets and subways of New York City. Some of you may have seen this. In the shape of a poster, the advertisement presented a simple apple, and below that, a caption that waxed rhapsodically like a childhood fable. This was the ad, and then there was text below it. Here's what the text said. This is an apple. Some people might try to tell you it's a banana. They might scream, banana, 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 or put banana in all caps. You might even start to believe that this is a banana, but it's not. This is an apple. Hashtag facts first. At the bottom, below the fruit, past the winsome prose poem and earnest slogan, appeared the logo for the product being promoted, CNN. <laughs> if something can be both sort of genius and kind of dumb at the same time, it might be this ad campaign. Undoubtedly, the message was crafted for its political moment. Under ceaseless partisan and economic assault, the mainstream media has, be, has been showing signs of duress for decades. But the presidential administration had been particularly relentless, not only rebuking specific news outlets and denigrating reporters by name, and screaming fake news to every exurban cul-de-sac that would repeat the signal. Facing the spread of mis misinformation, some marketer at CNN probably conjured the zany scheme to defend the media against the raiding barbarians with presto, an advertising campaign. Given the state of the media industry and the public battle being waged over basic facts, it was easy to sympathize with their plight. Until, that is, you realize the crux of their message behind the campaign. Some people think apples are bananas. Yes, it's true, the framing of the message accidentally exposed an implicit media elitism. They see bananas, but not you. And sure, the campaign seemed to imply that a dire epistemological meltdown could be resolved with the same crafty sloganeering that engineered think different and just do it. But behind all the convoluted rhetoric and the ownership, um, the ownership of truth stewed a deeper concern. Whether consciously or not, 
the campaign recalled another iconic image slash text juxtaposition. This is not a pipe. Long before cable news declared this is an apple, the surrealist painter Rene Magritte cut a more counterintuitive message with the dictum, this is not a pipe. Images, images for Magritte are not as they appear, or at the very least, words and pictures are out of sync. The very title of the painting, The Treachery of Images, is unequivocal in its attitude toward representation. Though, represented, though, though separated from modern mass media by nearly a century, the painting still whispers to us today. Images are elusive, language is fragmentary, the news is an imperfect simulation, and the media ranks presentation over information, entertainment over data. Maybe the apple really is a banana. During politically polarized moments, contrasting these images can be precarious. Facts are a contested battleground now more than ever. This book will not pretend to resolve that stalemate, but it will hopefully outline its vector through history and provide some space to consider how deception, manipulation, and subterfuge function in our society. We will try to separate apples from bananas, but any pomegranates discovered along the way will be joyfully devoured. So um, that, that sounds like a serious book, right? Um, and then you open it up and you go, wow, there's, there's entries in here about tribute bands and Chewbacca. Um, and it really is like a mix of high and low. Uh, and there are moments where I go crazy and decide to talk about Immanuel Kant. And there are moments where um, O.J. Simpson is of chief import. Um, and I hope, I hope that idea comes across that, um, that really it's like a battleground for, for information. So uh, I know that like, what time we got? Uh, readings are kind of boring, and so I'm not going to read a ton to you. Um, I'm going to play a little game. I have giveaways, too. That, we're giving a secret here. Uh, but oh, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, I thought i play a little game uh, where I ask you what you want to hear about. So I'm going to give you a couple options of which things you want read. Um, I have a whole bunch of them. I already can feel like I don't want to do all of these. Neither, you don't want to hear them all, either. So I'll start with this one. Um, option, I'll give you two options, and I want you to raise your hands on each one. Um, and I'll say what they are first. Um, the first one is, is history an illusion? The second one is, is everything an illusion? So I want you to vote by uh, raising your hands. One, again, is, is history an illusion? Number two is, is everything an illusion? Number one, is history an illusion? Is everything an illusion? Oh, everything wins. That's almost like, I almost gamed that, didn't I? <laughs> Misperception. So this entry is on um, simulism. Simulism is the belief that the whole goddamn fucking thing is a stupid video game. <laughs> also known as simulated reality hypothesis, simulis simulism posits that, we know, that what we know of reality, everything from the Big Bang to sour cream and onion chip flavor, is actually part of a giant computer simulator sh simulation. More than mere warmed over matrix theorizing, this little corner of the alternate reality universe contains actual physicists, physicists and philosophers, and of course, solar car enthusiasts. The astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson, for instance, is at least a partial believer. He has pegged the odds at 50-50 that we are digital beings living in a computer experiment. Elon Musk finds that wildly optimistic. Citing the improvements of video game fidelity during our lifetimes, the real world Iron Man puts the odds that we are living in, quote, base reality at, quote, one in a billion. And the Oxford philosopher Nick Bostrom the thinker most associated with simulism, has posited that our universe exists because an advanced civilization with enormous computing power decided to run simulations of other hypothetical universes. We live in one of those simulations. Simulism has been trendy of late, mostly by sheer coincidence of disconnected scientific projects, brain mapping, virtual reality, and artificial intelligence. Simulists often align those 
technical advances under the umbrella of post-humanism, or the belief that collision of biology and computers will soon usher in a state of transcendence over the limits of the human condition. This puts the simulated theory hypothesis in the same category of futurism that whatever is happening right now and multiply it into the invent horizon. The, here are some other examples of this, or examples of how this works. We have, com we have a lot of computing power today, but what if we had exponentially more? We can make computers talk today, so what if we're talking computers? Games have become ultra-realistic today, so maybe we are little Marios bumping our heads into virtual mushrooms. Precise mathematical principles now seem to rule the universe, so maybe the presets of our computer simulations. People like Instagram, so perchance, are we all just lobotomized bots mindlessly clicking virtual heart icons on pictures of food as part of a programmatic game theory experiment to determine how far humans will diminish their dignity? <laughs> it makes sense when you put it that way. Current events don't help matters. Most recent news developments seem the result of handing the joystick that controls the universe over to an erratic teenager. Let's see what chaos ensues if we give the Oscar to the wrong movie, let the Cubs win the World Series, and divide the world on the color of a dress. Um, I should say that the, the book has like hyperlinks inside of it and dress cross-references into a reference about the dress. Um, I don't, I don't have to explain what the dress is, I bet. Uh, surely, there must be a glitch in the machine. It must be all a test to see how we, re how we react. Did we pass? What are the cheat codes? Because this level kind of sucks. Simulism seems like the kind of unruly theory mongering that would never be tested. But scientists have actually devised experiments to prove this is all a simulation. Nothing has come of these studies yet, but just imagine for a moment that it worked, that science somehow conclusi conclusively proved we are living in a simulation. Then what? Do we become the hopeless bots in the sims peeing on ourselves and begging for mercy from our overlords? Or do we say, fuck it, let's shoot hookers like Grand Theft Auto? Bostrom, the philosopher, offers a theory. We start creating our own hyper-realistic simulated universes. And then creatures in those universes create even more universes. Like an MC Escher of Minecrafts inside of Minecrafts, eventually all the simulations gobble up too much memory in the master computer that runs our, our virtualizations, causing, causing the sysadmin in the sky to get annoyed and click the off switch. If this theory is true, we really need to shut down the Marvel Cinematic Universe immediately before it kills us all. Or maybe the master computer is an ob oblivious god who is just letting the system run for enjoyment, like a really long intergalactic version of Fast and Furious franchise. Maybe it makes no difference what we do. We might just be non-player characters hope hopelessly pressing the closed door button on the elevator, hoping to level up, but nothing ever happens. So, oh, that was that's one of the longer ones. They're mostly short. <laughs> Um, I have a whole list of here I was going to ask you to do all of them. That already took too long, I think. So I'm going to go to the giveaways. Uh, maybe I'll come back and do another reading. But um, so writing this book, writing is hard, but the really hard part for this thing was research. Um, I had to read an insane amount of bad material to write this. Um, and as my wife can attest, uh, our book is, our house is full of terrible books right now. And I started, decided to bring some of them. Um, these are things that I actually had to read along the way. Um, and uh, the way I'm going to do this is uh, I want you to raise your hand if you know the answer, and I'll give you the book. Uh, and it's a, it, these, are, these are definitions. This is an encyclopedia, after all. Um, these are definitions of these terms found in this book. Um, and this first one is a person. You ready? <laughs> Finally, someone came up with the ingenious idea to have this person write a memoir, but not just any memoir, a memoir that hypothesized how he would have committed the murder had he done it. 
I think I saw that. <laughs> David Gallagher. O.J. Simpson. So I did read of all of, all of uh, If I Did It, um, which is kind of interestingly back in the news because they, I don't know if you saw, like last week, Fox actually ran that interview. Um, and I already gave away that book, um, so I can't, but I do have Marsha Clark's <laughs> I have read to re so that I could re re write 300 words about if I did it. I read all of this. There you go. <laughs> All right, next one. I want, to, I want the reporters in the room. This part of the room right here should be ready. In May 2003, this young reporter was caught plagiarizing and... Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Jason Blair was caught plagiarizing, fabricating 50 of 650 articles for the New York Times over four years. And I don't, I don't know if people know this, but he actually wrote after his demise a book, uh, very controversially titled Burning Down My Master's House. Um, I would not recommend this book, but, uh, but thank you for taking it from me. <laughs> All right. Uh, Someone asked me the other day, is, oh, is this a book of urban legends? And I was like, no, it's not. I, don't, uh. um, I guess there's, there's one page that has a list of urban legends, um, because I felt like that has to get in there somewhere. Um, but I'm not really all that interested in a lot of the hoaxy type stuff. Um, but it, I, I pay its due, I guess. So uh, this is a, um, a creature. What creature am I describing? A strange animal carcass washes up. Uh, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, washes up on the shore of Long Island in the summer of 2008. Um, what you get is um, debunked from Richard Roper, the <laughs> film critic for the Chicago Sun Times, um, who's actually in the news recently. I don't know if people saw this. Uh, he. Uh, he was on the list of people, that, that New York Times story a couple weeks ago about all the people who had inflated Twitter account followers. They had too many people. Was this, that was a silly, uh, that story was like so, everyone's known that forever. I don't know how that story went viral. But anyway, um, yeah, so he's back in the news because of this. So uh, you get debunked. <laughs> oh, this is fun, right? Um, Another one, same category. Uh, I guess it's a person or a, it's a viral phenomena. Teen vlogger dumps her personal life on YouTube. What? <laughs> I couldn't hear you, Alan. P no, it's Slender Man, no. <laughs> well, I, I can keep it. Peter? No. Go, there, lots of people look at me. All right, Harry, Lonely Girl 15. Uh, things get crazy, she becomes a target of a cult. After months of intrigue, the series is exposed as an elaborate interactive uh, hoax. So you would be actually really shocked to learn that I actually read two Richard Roper books, <laughs> and you get the other one. <laughs> All right. Was, uh, the last one. This is, a, this is actually a cool thing. Um, my wife is happy that like, there's media disappearing from the house. Like, <laughs> we have a gigantic wall of DVDs that I had to dust off of. Um, this is the term? All of these are in the book, by the way. Um, derived, this is the hard one, I think. Derived from the matrix, this process, often used on web forums of the alt-right, red pilling, describes ingesting a capsule that allows you to see reality for what it is. And you get the entire DVD collection of the matrix. <laughs> wow, that's great. 
Um, yeah, we're getting late. I, I won't read anymore, and we'll stop giving ways. Uh, I'll invite Taylor up. Uh, you guys heard about Taylor, so uh, we'll just sit around and <laughs> sit around and rap for a while. I don't know what we're gonna talk about. Uh, everyone who's here just really wants to talk about Logan Paul. I know it. <laughs> I was <laughs> I was gonna joke about just only asking so you Taylor, questions about Jake and Logan Paul. <laughs> yeah, t Laura. <laughs> uh, Taylor is an expert on viral phenomena, um, and there's some of that in this book. Um, but if she started to ask quizzing me about the Paul brothers, I, I would... write a lot about like teen YouTubers. Basically, my life is all 14 year olds on Instagram and YouTube. Uh, but this week, actually, I everything I feel like in my life and everyone's life has been about um, uh, Facebook and mm -hmm. Cambridge Analytica. And it's not so much fake news, I guess, but I do think that you have an interesting take. Uh, that other people might not have about it. Is everyone familiar with the whole Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal? No, like, no. It's a tech <laughs> Have you ever heard of Facebook? It's a tech company. Uh, Rex, so it's sort of, you know, people uh, sort of it's widely assume that this is a sort of a negative thing uh, for the platform. What do you think? Uh, yeah, it's a setup. So I, um, <laughs> Uh, I've read every every one of your takes. I've read that. Like I've read every, I've read every story about this thing, and I do have uh, surprisingly, like it feels like there cannot be a new idea here, um, and maybe this isn't. Uh, but I do have a an inkling of a thought here. I guess there's two thoughts. The first thing I should say is that I am one of those people who who when they see the attribution of Cambridge Analytica of being some sort of geniuses, just shudders. Um, it was an accident, their success was an accident, and there are people who out there who are claiming that um, this micro-targeting was brilliantly executed and masterfully um, put 70,000 votes in three states into play that otherwise wouldn't be, and that's really complete bullshit. Even the Trump campaign thought that that was bullshit. But that's not the hot take, a lot of people are saying that. Um, here's the hot take. Um, uh, I think this is ultimately good for Facebook in the long run, and here's why. I know, that's a super hot take. Uh, so, imagine you're a company and, you're, and you have a Facebook page. Let's make up a name for a company. Um, it's called picketable.com. And it's like open table, but you can pick which seat you wanna sit at, at a restaurant. And you have a Facebook page, and you can, um, you collect data from Facebook on people who like it and follow it. And you want more data. And Facebook has put up regulations that say you only get so much amount of data. That has been the history of Facebook for the last 10 years. There have been people who, app developers, the media, researchers, who have been asking Facebook for more data. And Facebook doesn't want to give it up because that's bad for business. And I think that's a thing people are missing here is that Facebook doesn't actually want to do this data exchange. They don't actually want to give picketable.com any data because it hurts their business. Because if picketable.com has that data, what they're gonna do is take it and go and take the demographic data and go sell ads against it somewhere else on some other platform, Twitter, buy billboards, whatever, because they had no information about where people in Dallas buy pizza with this data. But Facebook doesn't want to give that up because what they want to do is use that data to sell advertising on their platform. And for the narrative of Facebook for the last eight years has been t demanding that they be more open with data. We've been asking for it, and I think it's our, it's our demands that are, that are coming through right now. You, researchers have been asking for it. You hear, you hear all the time about how Twitter is more open with data than Facebook from psychological researchers. This is a good example where tw that Facebook was trying to put up some guards. By the way, I don't want to make this sound like I think Facebook is holy in any way, shape, or form here. But I think that they've been trying to um, find some sort of boundary. And it, I think we are more at fault than anyone else. We've been asking for open, open transparency. It's all, it's all the user's fault, it's all us. <laughs> yeah, blame the victim, I know. It was a hot take, there you go. <laughs> hot take, it's the users who did this and you're all guilty. Yes. Um, okay, so you read a lot of conspiracy theories, fake news, all this stuff. Um, are there any that you 
like, are there anything, like, sometimes I, I feel like I've read so, you know, you, you read things, you hear stuff enough that you kind of start to believe it's true. Is there anything that you wrote about that you sort of started to question whether or not, like, something you knew was false, but you started to sort of reevaluate and consider maybe? Yeah, I mean, I, lo I definitely learned a ton. Um, I fell in love with a conspiracy theory, and... Um, I, I think this is the best. I, I, I think there's, I can't, I like ones you can't disprove, like anything that you can't, like the simulism was a good example. You can't, you cannot disprove it. Um, I like the theory that Elon Musk is actually an alien from outer space who is trying to build a spaceship to get back home. Um, <laughs> that's my favorite. Um, I didn't really I write about it. it in the book. I believe but it. But it makes sense when you hear it. It's like, oh, it all falls into place now. <laughs> Honestly, yes, you're right. Um, so you posted in the Facebook event so many questions, mm -hmm. um, and I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to answer some of them. Mm -hmm. um, so, but wait, this is zero stage. We had we have done no prep for this, so speak for yourself. You could tell by okay. my by okay. I would I would I would oh, I mean, no no I mean I, we, we didn't talk beforehand is what I meant. <laughs> Taylor did nothing. No no. <laughs> Now I'm going to read questions that I posted in the Facebook event. <laughs> it's been a week. Anyway, actually, this is something I, I think about a lot. Uh, is the, or I, don't, I watch the show Catfish, as I'm sure you guys do, and you posted about this in the, in the um, thing, like how real is the catfishing on MTV's Catfish? And I'm curious, do you have some kind of inside information? or what No, is real? there's a... Uh, uh, that list of questions is, is, they're all answered in the book in a sense. Uh, there's a little bit of subterfuge there. Um, it's in the footnote of the entry about catfishing. It, it's, I actually like that entry a lot because it kind of talks about how the show um, kind of follows a narrative procession and it, it is itself a construct. But there's a really good vulture piece from four, three or four years ago about the inner workings of um, catfish. The, the TV show, and it's one of the, I think one of the fascinating things about reality TV to me is we ha we know very little about how it's made. Still, we still don't know. Um, I mean, what, what's the show on Lifetime that everyone loves? Um, Unreal. Unreal. Like, despite like you get a sense watching Unreal that that's how it looks, right? That that's how it works. But we really don't know that much about how Survivor and Big Brother and Bachelor like really work, and I think that's interesting. Anyway, this, there's, a, there's a footnote in the story about catfishing that points to this vulture story that's really good, because it's the first time you actually, it gives a really good inside look, and the, it's a very rare case where the producers actually talk about how the show is made. Um, and I, I think that's actually like, a lot of the book has these moments where, because it's an encyclopedia, it's always pointing outward, like it's always referencing things and telling you to go look for somewhere else. Um, in that sense, it's a wiki hole. Like, it's always outwardly looking and trying to get you to put down the book and get on the internet. <laughs> bad, bad. <laughs> is it real or not, though? Uh, it is, no, it is. The, the, the main thing that's, that, that's not, that you don't <laughs> know is true. The narrative of the show is that a person who's being deceived <laughs> yes. contacts them. So they were deceived. The, the thing that is not true is that that's the thing that's not true. What actually happens is most of the time the person who's deceiving contacts the show ah, and says, I'm catfishing Ready someone to come else. Clean. Yes. Interesting. So um, take it maybe away from I was just curious about that for a long time. I'm glad you could answer that. Uh, so, you know, obviously you wrote a lot about like sort of misinformation and stuff, and um, it's so pervasive. And I think, especially as somebody who, as a reporter, like half of what I write is people, you know, or half the responses I get are like fake news, so, like lie, 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 lie. What do you think is responsible for, you know, people have blamed Facebook for sort of like the spread of misinformation. Um, do you think, what do you think social media's role in that is? Do you think that it, it is this sort of like new phenomenon where it's so widespread, or do you think that we've always had sort of these problems with these conspiracy theories, and it's they're, they're pervasive forever? And yeah, I I mean on that continuum between um, you know it, this is brand new and or it's it's as it ever was. I'm more on the side of as it ever was. Um, and I think when you read a book where you have to invest when you write a book where you have to investigate um, misdirection through history you immediately see that uh, this isn't actually that bad compared to the 19th century. Like, um, all of that said, uh, I think 
some of the analysis about the past, the, the very recent past, might be overstated. Um, but the but at the same time, the future is precipitous. Like, um, I there's a lot of good research going on right now about why people are sharing these stories, and it's not exactly what you would think. It's not that they're dumb, that's definitely not it, and it's not that they intentionally want to deceive you. Um, it's that they, like the, there, you, some people probably saw this headline last week, there was a study that was done that said um, fake news is seven times more likely to go viral than real news. That, that study is a little bit um, misleading, but the, it may not be seven times, but it, it's actually, to some degree, people are more likely um, to share something that seems as though it, it's fake than if not. And the reason for that isn't what it might seem like, though. It's not that they like deceiving people. It's like they like being first. They like the idea that I got this story about Hillary Clinton having a secret um, uh, uh, child porn ring in the basement of a pizza restaurant in, in Washington, D.C. Or like, I got that thing first, and people don't know about this. CNN hasn't reported this, and so I'm going to put this on to um, onto my Facebook account. And there's a, there's a thinking there is they don't really care so much about whether it's true or not. They care that it represents an idea that they have about the world already. And I think we're only kind of beginning to understand that. And um, I, in the book, I keep returning to the, the ideas that are similar to this. The, the entry, I almost read the entry on, on the Blair Witch Project, because I think this is kind of similar. I know this, like, this is a good high-low thing. Uh, so uh, does everyone remember like, when the Blair Witch Project came out, and there was like, this idea that uh, you were going to see a found footage movie, and it seemed like uh, it could really be real, right? right? Um, and, there, and that was the reporting around it. That's the way the media covered it. It was like these, these kids who are deceived by this found footage. And there was, the web, there was a website that looked like a found documentary. And there was a, um, at, at Cannes for the movie, they put up wanted posters. Great marketing, great marketing. And, uh, and so there's this idea that was passed around that people fell for it. I don't think anyone fell for it. I think everyone who went to it that at midnight they were playing along with the idea of falling for it. And that's kind of fun. And I think if you apply the idea of playing along to how some people perceive news and information sharing on the internet, I think you start to see kind of some rhyming going on. There's a similar kind of idea there that I don't, I don't have to really believe this. I just have to, it has to represent my identity in some way and I have to, it has to kind of, um, uh, see, seem real enough, and also um, like uh, make you get attention. Yeah. Are we getting? Should we wrap, wrap up? Yeah. We should have questions, maybe. Yeah, questions. Yeah. Don. Uh, why did you set about writing this? Why did you set about writing this book, encyclopedia? I should say. Um. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> The story is, um, yeah, like two or three years ago. It took a long time. Um, I, I wrote I wrote a piece in um, what was then Back Channel, and I guess now is Wired, uh, th two or three years ago, um, edited by Stephen Levy over there. Thank you. Um, that was about going back to my hometown in um, rural North Dakota, and. Uh, that piece did really well, and out of that, uh, a bunch of um, agents contacted me, uh, including Rachel, who's not here, I don't think. Uh, and I talked to, talked to them, and they, they were all like, you shared a book. And I was like, ah, I don't want to turn that into a book. It's funny, cause maybe I should have turned that into a book, because that would actually be doing really well right now, too. Like, every, everyone wants to do these yeah. like investigations of what people in Appalachia think. Yeah, you're like, from North Dakota. Yeah, exactly. Um, but anyway, uh, I was like, I didn't want to write that book. Maybe I will someday. But um, I, and I, ha I had for years kept um, a list of things that I wanted to write for, I think, 15 years old, this list is. It started as a text document, and then it became a Google Doc, and now it's in Wonderlist. And it was, um, I really only, up until, up until this, I had only really written um, kind of like one big thing a year, because um, I'd been working on other projects. And... But I had this list, 
and it had 800 entries. And it was just like ideas that are interesting to me that I would like to one day write about. And uh, so when the idea of writing a book came along, I looked at the list and I was like, which of these can I make into a book? And I started to look at the list and kind of go, I can put all of them into a book, <laughs> um, which is an insane, stupid idea. But I was like, I tried to look for a pattern in them and said, is there like a theme that I'm interested in? And it was clearly um, deception, manipulation, things, things where things don't, where things aren't what they appear. And so that, that I was like, ah, I'm gonna put the, I don't, <laughs> I don't like books that like have like a, a singular message they're trying to drill into you all the way through. Like I think of like Malcolm Gladwell's books as like this kind of like, by the time you're done, you're like, I get it, I get it, I get it. And like, I just took the approach that like, I got 300 ideas and I'm gonna put them all, in, all together. You can tell like, I had a blog like once upon a, like I, it reads a lot like a blog. Hey. Is that JC? Yeah. Hey JD. Nice hat. Thanks. Um, my question is uh, whether or not you think there is, uh, so, so the right thinks the left is all fake news, CNN, fake uh -oh. news. The, the left <laughs> thinks, the left thinks America's most reputable website, Breitbart.com is fake news. So my question is, uh, who's right? <laughs> This is going to get fun. Um, um, I think I'll answer it this way. I think that uh, every night um, before I go to bed, I try to tune in Tucker Carlson. And my wife is, can attest to this, that I do this. And I do it. Um, and I, have, I actually have friends, some of who are here, who have questioned why I would do that. Um, and it's not so that I can have a balanced news diet, as one might sort of expect, like an answer is, I want to hear both sides, quote unquote. Um, it's not that. It's more like, I, and, and also I read, I, I go to the, some people get shocked when I say this, uh, I go to the front page of Breitbart every day. Um, and it's not so <laughs> that I can, um, again, not, it's not like a balanced news diet thing. I don't need to hear the other side in that, in that kind of strict factual sense. It's more that <laughs> I'm really curious about how they're constructing arguments. And I think, um, I don't know. I don't know how many of you felt after the election that it was like, I mean, be, being from rural North Dakota, I just felt like, oh my god, I know these people and I don't know if they know what they did and I want to reach out to every one of them. And I only felt sorrow and empathy and compassion. I did not feel anger um, like a lot of other people did. Um, and so, I'm st and I'm still stuck in that mode where I'm thinking as much as I can about not like, uh, you know, is, th is this side right or is this side wrong? Because I have pretty firm, strong beliefs on which side's right. But but rather, I'm trying to think about how they think about things and um, trying to empathize with that. And hopefully, I don't know, I think that media literacy right now is like, should be more focused on this idea of looking at how other people are um, working through political issues and much less about um, getting on Twitter and y yelling at other people ab about what they believe. Um, that's it. I didn't answer that question. <laughs> so I really like Taylor's idea of uh, just Thank taking you. things. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, which idea? Uh, taking this questions things. for Taylor. <laughs> no, ask about Logan <laughs> Paul. So Go ahead. Uh, I have questions. Taking the things that were already written uh, on the Facebook event. Uh, and asking you one of those oh, questions okay, okay. again. But I also like Rex's idea of, of choice. So, so there's two things I'm interested in that are in this book, and you can choose which one you talk about. Um, so so uh, one is, uh, is pornography normal? Or, or you can talk Not about that one. Uh, the, there's a moment that's like glitches in the Matrix page, right? Um, and the last one is 
you know, so like it's like you know, did the was there a movie that Sinbad was in that was called Shazam, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so some of them we know, but one is like Nelson Mandela died in prison in the '80s. Actually, Nelson Mandela died in 2013. I'm really curious to hear about what that theory is, that Nelson Mandela died in prison. How do people, what was that? Oh, uh, I think a lot of people know this. There's a, uh, uh, a theory out there that called the Mandela Effect. Um, and that, that chart you're referring to is, is um, under that theory. Um, and... Uh, there's a very, very active Reddit on this topic uh, uh, in which people are trying to identify um, moments where um, you thought that, you, that this was true, and it turns out this is true. And there's a chart of them in the book. Uh, and one of them is the Nelson Mandela thing. Not everyone ha has the same memory, but some people do. And there's this idea that there is a rift in the space-time continuum a little bit like the symbolism entry, that uh, there are in fact uh, this is a mo this is a glitch in the matrix. This moment in which um, the the computer program is spitting up things by accident that are you, you because you remembered it one way that actually did happen that way. There's also an entry in the book about the Berenstein Bears. Most people know that story, right? Um, Berenstein versus Berenstein. Everyone's shocked to discover that it's spelled stain um, and that that actual entry is like because I kind of like redone this idea over and over again I turned that into a short story that's like a good example of just like riffing on the idea in a new way but um, yeah that that's the background of that thing you should see reddit man yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah Glitch in the Matrix on Reddit is just, it's, it's one of the better things. Yeah. Should we wrap up? So, oh, we got one more. Yeah. I think we got time for just one more. Hi, Rex. Um, Hi. Of all the reasons that you saw people might have tried to deceive other people for political ends or to sell something, um, in the course of researching this book, did you encounter any reasons for deceiving others that you felt were valorous or like you could sympathize with it, apart from just trying to pull the wool over other people's eyes? Yeah, um, I didn't. I don't cite any specific examples like that. Um, but I talk about uh, there's an idea that uh, this is. I'm, I'm jumping up to high culture again here. There's an idea that Plato talks about in the Republic. Um, called Noble Truth, that, and it's the idea that there are times when rulers should be lying to us and so that we buy into mythologies that are, in the, in the long run, ultimately are better for society if we trust this myth. And it's certainly the most fascist idea that Plato has ever introduced, right? It's like looking back on it, and he's, he's supposedly one of the founders of you know, modern democracy, and he's introducing this idea that we fall for it. Um, but you see it today, right? You see that idea that it's, oh, I mean, I have to, I kept, I, I'm so glad we've made it all the way through this conversation and not said Trump once, but you can see it um, all the time is that the mythology supersedes belief. And that was, that was actually my fear after the election, that they we're going to enter this moment where um, that we were going to, that our new ruler was going to be able to create a reality. And I think we've done a fairly good job of fighting that off. Um, uh, but yeah, go back to the Republic. You can see uh, the founding moments of democracy have the same ideas of tricking people to believe things and it being good for them. Like that's, it's really sinister. Everyone read Plato's The Republic. <laughs> Thank you both for coming and talking about this awesome book. Thank you.